Hi, uh, a huge, huge thanks to uh, Uzma and uh, her uh, incredible ability to always, I think, amaze us by the kind of uh, radical nature of the, of the deep past um, and the relationship between, I think, real, real things and invisible things. And it reminds um, me of uh, one of the, the a, a sort of arc that we, we're going to explore in March um, with three really amazing guests. Uh, we will have the uh, writer and historian uh, William Dalrymple, and he will be uh, giving us insights from his very, very newest and latest book, which is uh, a history of the East India Company, arguably the world's first multinational corporation. Um, we then have Slavs and Tatars, who are going to um, uh, reinterpret the Silk Road, both as it was, uh, as it is, and as it might be. And then also the uh, writer and artist and filmmaker Trevor Paglin, um, who will be talking about the trade of information um, and uh, of data diagnostics, um, and, and all three, in a way, are dealing with a sort of scale of trade that is that operates at the scale of the planet, uh, of the kind of making and remaking of the planet through different forms of uh, of, of, of literally drawing trade uh, across the surface of the earth. So on to uh, this session now, uh, which we call Build. I'd like to start with a, a question which many of you may have thought about over, already over the past 16 years. Why was the most audacious attack of the 21st century aimed at two slim skyscrapers, also known as the Twin Towers, also known as New York's World Trade Center? Why that target? Why was it singled out? Of course, there was spectacle, which didn't happen once, but twice in quick succession. A spectacle that could only be comprehended through our memories of cinema and special effects. But how much did it matter that this was a world trade center? Buildings are as much symbols as they are buildings. They're vessels of intended meaning and unintended interpretation. There's a long, rich history that ties architecture to trade through factories, banks, stock exchanges, markets, global governance entities. What is the architecture of Davos, AKA the World Economic Forum, which opens also this coming week? The thing is, the activity of trade is equally invisible and visible. But arguably, architecture makes it apparent in a physical and public way, in ways that can be admired or indeed attacked. To explore the multiple lives of trade's architectural appearance here in the region, the region that Uzma so beautifully um, laid out for us, I have three brilliant guests, Nura al Sai, Wael Al-Awar, and Todd Rice. I'm going to introduce them individually, one by one, as we go through the, the next uh, hour or so. But I've asked them to share one or two examples from their own research, their own writings, and their own practices, which articulate the architectural language of trade. So first up, we have Noura al Sayy. Noura is an architect and curator, currently working at the Bahrain Authority for Culture and, Antiqu and Antiquities as head of architectural affairs, where she's responsible for overseeing and planning and implementation of cultural institutions and museums, as well as the creation of an active agenda of exhibitions and academic exchange initiatives. She's also been a uh, curator and, and sort of mastermind behind, I think, some of the most interesting and compelling uh, of the uh, architecture pavilions of Bahrain's, of course, at the Venice Biennial over the last uh, number of years. So uh, will you join me in please welcoming Noura al Say? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the intro, Shimon. I'm really happy to be here uh, as well. Um, 
Obviously, when you asked me to talk about trade in Bahrain, it was really difficult to avoid the kind of poster card, uh, the postcard uh, of the pearl trade traders' houses that Bahrain is really well known as and is was the capital of the pearling industry in the Gulf. Um, these buildings, you know, that we, we all are really familiar with in the Gulf, uh, have come to represent today an idea of a local architecture that was using local materials such as coral stone that was extracted from the sea, uh, lime plaster that was using uh, seashells from the seashore to get the whiteness, and have come to um, represent the counter the counterweight of a kind of more generic architecture that has started appearing after the discovery of oil in the 1930s. Um, and actually, it's really interesting because I've been working now in Bahrain for around eight, nine years. So it's always interesting when you work in a place for a really long time, after a while you start realizing that all the assumptions and the kind of initial ideas that you had turned out to be quite the opposite of what you uh, thought. Um, and last year we started working um, on an exhibition for the Venice Biennale, uh, the last edition, so 2016, where we were starting to look at uh, the impact of aluminium in architecture in the Gulf, linked to obviously the discovery of oil in the 1930s, and sorry, the appearance of the first aluminium smelter in Bahrain in the 1970s, as a direct relation to the discovery of oil because uh, the smelting of aluminium obviously requires a lot of energy and the reason why a lot of aluminium smelters are found in the Gulf is because uh, energy is so affordable. Um, and we were starting to look at this obviously with also the assumptions that the kind of architecture they were producing, um, which we see here and you obviously see a lot uh, around you was a really generic architecture that was not producing, you know, to a certain extent, a local identity or any markers that would, um, you know, represent the Gulf and the specific locale in a, in a specific way. Um, and at the same time, as we were working on this exhibition, we started working on the conservation of the Siadi Mejlis, uh, of which we see a picture here. Uh, which is the most emblematic uh, building of the pearl uh, of the pearl era, where you know these pearl traders that were trading pearls all over the world, from the royal courts um, of India to Europe to the United States, were starting to develop also an architecture that was a lot more expressive than it had been. This is obviously the epitome of this, with. You know, one of the few examples in the Gulf with such a decorative uh, exterior facade. And we had always assumed, and, you know, this building is quite well known, that this building was representative of this era, that it was from the 1930s, and that it was using all these local materials that we kind of refer to uh, in terms of an indigenous architecture. Um, and as we started working more closely on this building, we discovered that it was actually built in 1952 that uh, there's actually a steel beam in the ceiling that's supporting uh, the span of this roof, that most of the wood was imported from India and Persia at the time. Um, you know, the, the, the glass is also imported from Persia. A lot of the decorative elements come from India, are influenced from uh, Persia, from some European examples of the time. Uh, and even more so, we started doing some plaster analysis and realized that even in the lime plaster mixes that are used uh, on the buildings, um, there's some pottery shards that are found that are even from outside of Bahrain. So these kind of buildings, you know, that the dichotomy between them and this more generic lifestyle that you would think are so, are so evident turned out to be completely different than we thought. And this local architecture that, uh, you know, that we, we try to defend so much, uh, was actually using materials from such a, you know, such a wide area um, and represented, you know, this era of the pearl uh, so much more than this architecture that we're looking at uh, today. And when we started having a look, uh, you know, a bit more closely at the aluminium industry in Bahrain, 
uh, the architecture that it's producing, uh, we started to realize that actually these buildings were using so much more local materials and local um, craftsmanship, let's say, to a certain degree, than the architecture of the, of the pearl trade. Um, so you see the way these buildings that actually try to express an era of you know, prosperity, of trade, of openness, of you know, everything that the oil industry brought, brought with it, are actually built mostly with block work that's locally produced, with uh, you know, locally made aluminium window frames that are done uh, mo most often than not in local workshops such as these. So the, the presence of this aluminium smelter in Bahrain has produced uh, you know, a, da a, a downstream industry that accounts for more or less 25% of the GDP of Bahrain. In reality, it means that there's around you know, 800 workshops that work with aluminium in Bahrain that produce everything from countertops to kitchens to window frames to, uh, to, uh, to doors. I mean, I, I understand in Dubai, 800 is not a lot, but Bahrain is a small country, so we, let's say 800 million, if you want. <laughs> Um, and that actually, you know, there's a whole rhetoric of trade that we, we hear about in the Gulf and that we project and there, there's, there's, there's this whole image uh, of an architecture of trade, whereas actually if you look at it a bit deeper, um, you know, the Gulf states are unfortunately becoming a lot more protectionist than, than we would like to say. I, you know, I see this up close because regulations in the tender board change very often and, you know, they become uh, a lot more focused on things being locally produced, on the number of local workers being employed, on the number of Bahrainis working in a company. And all these things have become so much more regulated than they were in the 1930s. And the consequences of them are that in reality, you know, the economies are actually, in, in terms of constructions, probably closing up a lot more than they're opening up. I mean, South, for example, in Bahrain, it's a small country. Um, and these have tremendous consequences. Saudi, two years ago, banned the export of sand outside of Saudi, which means that in Bahrain it's becoming increasingly difficult to produce cement, which you would think, you know, in this region, why is there a shortage of sand? A year and a half ago... <laughs> why is there a shortage? <laughs> there's a big shortage of sand, and actually sand is one of, in Bahrain, one of the most expensive commodities you can think of. Can you explain um, that? Because we assume... Sand is everywhere. Yeah, you, I also assume that. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bahrain doesn't have a lot of sand. Uh, the UAE doesn't export sand very easily. It also needs to go through Saudi. Saudi has banned, it's not exactly sure why, but two years ago they banned the export of sand. They banned the export of palm trees a year and a half ago. So now it's nearly impossible to find palm trees. So all the things that you think represent kind of, you know, a local expression yeah. uh, of identity you know, become even more difficult to find. And the economies are actually, you know, despite the rhetoric that goes around, closing up a lot more than they're opening. Or at least this is, you know, the position of how it is in, in Bahrain. Maybe I'll end that there. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe just a, a couple of questions and then we'll yeah. go through and then we'll, we'll sort of have a conversation. But if... Um, you know, you showed the Saidi house, and you know this is the kind of jewel in the crown of. Uh, you know, I mean, again, we can think about the map that Uzma showed us with the Dilmun, uh, and uh, I mean, according to some accounts, uh, you know, epic, uh, the epic of Gil in the epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh goes pearl diving off in Dilmun, and some say it was Bahrain. Um, and so this, this incredible history, uh, which as we said, goes back mil millennia, um, then is given this, very, this sort of um, uh, noble incarnation uh, in, the, in, the, in the Saidi house. Uh, 1932, as you said, early 30s, oil is discovered in Bahrain, uh, one of the earliest uh, discoveries here in the region. Um, what, and, uh, was there a, uh, a, a concomitant manifestation, architectural manifestation uh, in Bahrain uh, that, that gave a noble symbolization to, to oil, or did it take a different form? Was the city itself 
in a way, the architecture of, of oil. I mean, the, the, the discovery of oil and the arrival of oil in Bahrain, and probably also in the region, you know, marked the start of an important, imported model of urbanization. You know, with the discovery of oil, the first American companies came, so then the first, um, you know, uh, gated communities and compounds for the oil workers in Hawali were created. The car arrived at the same time. So it was really actually a rupture, um, you know, and these old cities, the pearl divers basically turned into oil workers overnight because the, the, the work in the pearl industry was so tough that there was, you know, it was a blessing to go and work in the oil fields. Uh, and it really, you know, it happened in a rupture and it, uh, it was really, you know, the start of franchising, the start of, you know, importing another model of urbanization. And for a long time, they kind of lived side by side. So, you know, Muharraq, where the pearl divers were, you know, kind of turned into decay and other parts of the, of the country were, were developed. And it's only, I think... Um, when we, when things started being produced locally, and probably the, the, the biggest and first manifestation of that was the aluminium smelter. Mm. And the idea behind it was already, you know, to start diversifying away from the oil economy, to start, you know, there was a general idea in the Gulf in the 1970s uh, to start producing things locally. And when that happened, I mean, I didn't talk about it, but there was this one image that Camille took of this kind of transitional moment when they were kind of still trying to invent a kind of local identity but using these new materials. And you find a lot of these kind of um, examples of buildings that were built in the 1980s with kind of arches made with aluminium uh, materials. So, so for a long, you know, there was, there, there was a search at that point, I think, to try to establish, you know, what you would call uh, a local identity using these materials. Uh, and was and, there, you know, sorry. it was... Was there a sense, because both, um, one can think of pearls uh, and oil as almost uh, like uh, providential resources, you know, blessed lands. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's often the case that blessing is finite and uh, either it runs out or, so, or something, a new technology arrives and eclipses yeah. it. And, um, it, it does, does the, uh, the industry of aluminium fit in that narrative or is it is it considered more of an invention rather than a discovery of uh, of, of a providential uh, industry yeah I mean there's a strange relationship with uh, with aluminium because in a way it's something uh, that's really it feels more secretive I mean at, a, at least at a popular level again in terms of the romance of pearls the romance of oils one doesn't think about the romance of aluminium smelting. <laughs> no, it's true, but <laughs> but I mean, in, in Bahrain, there's like an immense pride with this aluminium factory because it was one of the first, um, and it was, you know, the first sign that things could be locally uh, produced here. And there was all, I mean, in the book, you, you saw the publication that we did. There was this huge um, promotional campaign that the aluminium factory did where they were going trying to try to tie the craftsmanship of aluminium to the old craftsmanship of, uh, of copper smelting from the time of Dilmun um, and all these things to kind of try to inscribe it uh, in a kind of community and continuity and in terms of um, you know the first I, I think the first organized labor union in the Gulf was that of Alba in the 1970s. So it, it was Alba and uh, Babco, the first, the, the oil company, they really kind of, uh, uh, you know, they ushered the era of, uh, you know, of organized workforce, of unions, of labor unions. They were also at the start of the political parties in Bahrain. So up to today, you know, there is this kind of pride of working for Alba, uh, you know, people that work there, work there for, you know, 50, 60 years. There's a, you know, there's a kind of sports club. So it's a kind of, in the same way that the, you know, Hawali has that with the, with the oil community. Um, and this, this melter is now expanding. So in, I think in, a, in, in five years, it's going to be the largest single site smelter in the world. Wow. And that's something that, I mean, it doesn't really mean anything. It just means that, you know, there's no environmental control in Bahrain so that they can actually put all, exactly. all three of their smelters in the same place. 
Um, but you know, it's something that the country is really, really proud of. Fantastic. Uh, will you please join me in thanking Noor Al Say? We're going to keep this uh, moving. So, um, uh, my next guest is uh, Todd Rice. Todd is an architect and writer. He's also the Rose Visiting Assistant Professor at Yale University School of Architecture, where he teaches courses in urbanism and Gulf urban history. He's currently writing a book about Dubai's early modernization through the lens of architecture. He's been a I'm guest at the, at the Global <laughs> Art Forum uh, before. And, um, and when it came to this question of uh, how does architecture give form or speak trade, uh, it was a kind of no-brainer to invite Todd uh, to talk about uh, uh, a very beloved uh, uh, building an icon here in Dubai. So, will you please join me in welcoming Todd Rice? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah? Mm, no. So kind of coming on. No. <coughs> a moment, I think. Good. Thank you, Shuman, for the introduction and, and for the invitation uh, to be here this evening. Um, as Shuman mentioned, I've been working on a book about Dubai's early modernization. And uh, what's particularly important is, is how this history of modernization is so indebted uh, to the ties that Dubai has to places beyond its own borders. And by that I mean not only things coming here, but also then leaving here as well, going back to the word Schumann used earlier today, entrepôt. Um, so I've been asked to, to, to say a few things about the World Trade Center. Um, and um, I thought I'd share a few things um, about the World Trade Center um, in, the, in the form of a 10-minute tale, since I'm supposed to speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, um, and I'm going to rely on my, my box of information that I've been collecting uh, for this book. Um, and just so you know, uh, writing a book about Dubai's history is very difficult. <laughs> uh, formal, ar formal archives don't exist, and, and if they do exist, they don't seem to be made available very easily. And so I've actually had to build my own, building up uh, collections of correspondence of dignitaries, of, of, of engineers, newspaper clippings, marketing brochures, bad fiction, even a failed movie script, and also, of course, looking at the city's architecture. Um, and if, as we are told, and this is something we could discuss, uh, if it is true that Dubai's modern history is something that's 50 years old, 10 minutes is a significant amount of time. Uh, it's not a percentage point, uh, certainly, but it's definitely a, an amount of time that's tangible uh, and, and a significant amount of time in which a decision could be made or, or even unmade. And 10 minutes, my guess, um, was the amount of time it took for Sheikh Rashid, pictured here, to correlate the advice of his advisors and choose the location for the World Trade Center, uh, which was supposed to be near the airport, an intelligent and totally lo logical place to put a global node of trade. Uh, it's where people with real money and of real status entered the city, and this is where gold used to enter the city. It's where diplomats, dignitaries, businessmen, were introduced to Dubai's ambitions and were able to introduce their own. Ten minutes was also probably just enough time to realize it wasn't going to be near the airport and would go to its next location. Suspense. <laughs> Which was supposed to be at Dubai Creek. Uh, on Dubai Creek, the project's architect, uh, which was John R. Harris, who's a major protagonist in my book, um, he tried out a twin tower scheme, I just realized, just learned recently. Um, and obviously, he's referring here to New York City's World Trade Center, which he did go to visit uh, on Sheikh Rashid's bill, and which would, of course, have an enduring effect on what Dubai's World Trade Center would be but it probably took about less than 10 minutes until this scheme was erased. As most of you probably know, the, the eventual site for the World Trade Center would have been at what we now know as the beginning of what we now call Sheikh Zayed Road, which is featured here to your right, uh, going into the distance. And it's here where I'm going to base our 10-minute tale. 
And I'm going to say that this tale is about you. And you are a, a businessman in the year 1980. And a taxi driver picks you up at the airport. You've come to sell parts for an oil drill. Or maybe to sell legions of commercial vans to a labor camp. Or better yet, and this is what we'll stick with, you're a Sony executive. Uh, and you've come uh, to promote Betamax technologies for Dubai's burgeoning television pro programming. I thought Betamax 1980 is a very good fit. So your driver picks you up at the airport and he's taking you to the Hilton Hotel, a respectable hotel, a well-known global brand, uh, but you actually didn't want to stay at the Hilton Hotel. You wanted to stay at the Sheraton Hotel, where you would have uh, had a view of the Dubai Creek and its famous Dows and been able to absorb some of the, the, the kind of local legend of, glo of gold smuggling. But that hotel and everything else along uh, the Dubai Creek was already fully booked. Therefore, the only option for you was the Hilton Hotel. And it was ready, of course, uh, to make you feel at home. And it is here where the 10-minute tale will begin, at the Hilton Hotel of the World Trade Center. The 10-minute clock will start after you have checked in uh, at the hardwood lobby desk, flanked by fountains and tropical plants. And then after you have walked across the expansive foyers and hallways of deeply plush carpet, that soften each step of your shoes' wooden soles. And such deep carpet, I might let you know, was actually a very impossible surface of luxury in a landscape of sand. But it is what you, a global businessman, have come to expect and what the Hilton Hotel might be able to offer. After the bellhop has opened your door's suite, your suite's door, as if it were a door to a jewel safe, and after you've scanned the room for all its accoutrements, which include a touch-tone phone with one button service to the front desk, and then, of course, that latest symbol of away-from-home luxury, the minibar. At the moment you close the minibar door, that's when this 10-minute tale begins. You walk over to get a glimpse of the outside beyond this freon chilled bastion of comfort. You look out from the window, the narrow slit of a window in your room, and just so you know, um, a quick side note, the building's ungenerous use of glass, that is, its very small windows, was actually the most cited reason why this luxury hotel was eventually imploded by dynamite. But back to your story. So um, you begin to get a sense as you look out the window uh, of where you are. Lily pads and lattice gardens, a swimming pool in the shade, and suited waiters serving people lounging defiantly in bathing suits. You turn around to make a quick call to your colleagues, on the room phone, of course, and they're waiting for you. The bellboy helps you with your bag so you can swiftly change into, as they say, a fresh shirt and head back down to the hotel's amber-lit lobby. And then you go out. And it takes a few seconds of these 10 minutes for your eyes to adjust to the globular white light of a Dubai day. And you realize that you're not standing on the ground. Instead, you're on the raised platform, platform of the World Trade Center complex, meters away from the desert below your feet. Underneath you is a whole level of machinery churning out coolness for you and others staying at the Hilton Hotel. To your left is another box-like building, similar to your hotel, but with even fewer windows. And you know it's the complex's exhibition center, Dubai's largest unobstructed and closed space. It can accommodate ice skating rinks and boxing rings. And as large as it was, it was actually deemed too small the day it opened. And looming directly before you is, of course, the most memorable part of the complex, what really is the World Trade Center. When one said World Trade Center in 1980, it probably sounded less like World Trade Center and more like the three English language words combined to mean something, world 
Trade Center, the world's place of trade. Uh, go back. Okay, we'll, can you take it back? Thank you. As singular as the World Trade Tower was, the offices ta uh, inside it were unabashedly self-same and economically simple. Every floor shared the same footprint, the same particle fiber doors, the same easy to vacuum carpet tiles. Your fellow Japanese colleagues are located in Sony's offices on the 14th floor, but they've asked you to meet them on the 33rd floor, where the building's management company is getting ready to open Dubai's first members only businessman's club. You take the, the express elevator to meet them at the top. After you've shaken hands with your Sony colleagues, you look out over the city. And it is here where you look out. This is here where Dubai explains itself to you. Looking northward in the distance through a relentless cloud of construction dust, you can make out the old city that you'll probably never visit. The World Trade Center is far away from the city but you are not stranded out here alone. You are part of a new city, one that calls out as much to inhabitants of the old city as to the rest of the world to come to defect to this place of modernity, to this place of comfort. Straight before you, in the direction of the Persian Gulf, is the axis of this new city that connects the World Trade Center to Port Rashid, a 15-year building project at the edge of the Gulf waters. Between the port and you is an activated mat of modern bustle. Quonset huts and temporary warehouses, mounds of earth, tents and sheds assembled by and for laborers, forgotten debris from earlier phases of construction, all of it manned by South Asian men wearing loose-fitting clothes and probably sandals. The World Trade Center offers you a skybox to watch the show. You are the spectator, the activator, and the investor. Without yet having seen your company's Dubai headquarters, and within this story's 10 minutes, the World Trade Center has made itself crystal clear to you. City life, urban life, is no longer about complexity or confusion or even discovery. Now it is about simplicity, legibility, and room service, displayed on ice, laced with Muzak, and offering an express elevator to the top. The story was written in catchphrases and buzzwords, small words written big in a full-page advertisement in the Financial Times. That's where your 10-minute story comes to a close, ending with complete comprehensibility. Dubai is a stapling up and a piling on of 10-minute stories millions of them. And if I had another 10 minutes, I'd tell you a story that starts not at the airport and not at the piers of Dubai Creek, but instead at dusk on the waters of the Persian Gulf. This second 10 minute story would not be about the place of trade, but about the trade of place. About people, mostly men, but also women, children, who flip their homes in, let's say, Pakistan for a chance to live and work in Dubai. They left their families. They risked their lives on boats whose engines might fail, stranding the passengers at sea to die of thirst. Or more likely a tragedy, though, was that the ship, overburdened by an overcrowded hull of people, would make violent and death-causing contact with a sandbar in the Persian Gulf's shallow waters. Uh, with another 10 minutes, I could tell you about one of these shoreline tragedies unfolding in 1968. A passenger ship hit a sandbar, split in two, and burst into flames. No one knows how many died. Those who survived waited in a makeshift camp until they could either escape or be sent back home. This was a refugee camp that was located right next to what was about to become a huge construction site within just a matter of days. The construction would be of Port Rashid, 
refugee camp versus construction site. These were not opposites. They were intricately related. Port Rashid would be its own village, starting with 3,000 people, and thousands and thousands of more would come, eventually joining, and most of them coming by the boats like I've described. <coughs> Eventually, armies of workers, and that's what they called them, armies of workers, could look out from Port Rashid toward the rising World Trade Center tower, from one end of the new city looking toward the other end of this new city. These workers were not only the first to work, but also the first to live in this concrete injected vision of city living, a just-in-time substitute for utopia. The moment when the most people ever were at the World Trade Center was the day that Great Britain's Queen Elizabeth II came to officially open the unfinished tower. All segments of Dubai came to watch. They gathered at the guard guarded barriers, but those who actually with the best views were those looking down on the crowds. These were the Pakistani builders in their shawar kameez billowing in a Dubai breeze. For the Queen's visit in February 1979, the builders had prepared the tower so far as to be cloaked in its recognizable concrete skin, but it was hardly finished on the inside. The Pakistani builders knew the tower better than anyone else, and if just for a moment could control it, could climb it, and take advantage of it to capture and take in the spectacle below them. For Elizabeth II's visit to Dubai, time was terribly structured. It was choreographed. Her schedule was designed down to the minute. Time was divided into when she could wave to the crowds, when she would cut a, uh, cut a ribbon, or when she could pull back the curtain to reveal a new plaque. At the World Trade Center, just like the Sony salesman, she took the elevator to the top to look out and to read for herself Dubai's mission statement, being written on to a transforming landscape. She was back at her catered lunch in the Hilton Hotel in 10 minutes. At this point, I've gone over my 10 minutes, but my overspill could be counted as part of the plot. A 10 minute tale in the city of Dubai can seem so vacuous and so superfluous, but really, really, it is spread out toward the horizon. It is connected to everything and it is hypersaturated and overflowing to the point that 10 minutes can last forever. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Todd. That was uh, vivid uh, and time transporting. I wonder, um, my first question would be about this, uh, the date that it opens, or the year that it opens, 1979, and whether we could go into that a little bit, because one of the things we, we alluded to in our introduction today is that we're at a point uh, in uh, history, uh, a point in certainly the history of globalization, where many people are now saying that uh, a certain kind of ex ex uh, economic and political uh, project that started around 1979 and 1980 is, uh, is, uh, is over or is being threatened in a really profound way. And so one of the things that happens in 1979 is Margaret Thatcher is of course elected in the UK, followed very soon after by Ronald Reagan of course in, in America. Uh, of course 1979 the Iranian Revolution uh, and the transformation in the, in the region politically, uh, also certain political events in Saudi Arabia um, uh, that can also be seen as a sort of culmination of, uh, of the oil crisis that had started already in 73. Um, so is, um, and also importantly in 1979 in terms of uh, the Jebel Ali port, um, uh, also in, in Dubai, these sort of two... Um, uh, totemic um, uh, statements about uh, Dubai's uh, future in relation to global trade. Mm. Um, 
is it, uh, is it a, a kind of accident of history that the World Trade Center opens at, 90, in, at 1979? Or is it, does it somehow play a, a role in that, in, that, in that larger story of uh, you know, the, the, the beginning of a certain kind of economic neoliberalism uh, and the financialization of, uh, of global economy? <laughs> there might be a simple answer, which is no. <laughs> Well, uh, I was thinking about, you know, I mean, architecture is, 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 a, is a field that moves very slowly, yep. right? I mean, by the time, the, the time between the, the idea of, of commissioning a building to the point where you actually open the door, is, is there's so much happens. Um, and I would say that, you know, in 1974, when this it was when the building is commissioned, mm. and, and there's a whole kind of legend that I won't get into about why it happened. But at that point, it was really focused on exhibition. Um, and you find these almost cute descriptions of how this tower was going to be used, where there were going to be these kind of exhibition rooms where people could come and look at Yugoslavian furniture on floor 14, while on floor 12, one could come look at Asian fabrics. Um, and you know, by the time, actually, when this building became more occupied, it was more like 80, 81. It's really being filled with mostly oil-related mm. uh, companies and government uh, companies as well. Sony was indeed there, mm. but um, I think also something that quickly changes is that I've made the connection between Port Rashid and uh, mm. global uh, the World Trade Center. But actually, what happens in the meantime is that yes, Port Jebel Ali is is brought in, and actually the Queen. Uh, when she comes to visit, her ship is staying near Port Rashid, uh, and she's gone to Port uh, Jebel Ali before she comes to the, um, to the tower. She opens Jebel Ali yeah, as yeah, yeah. well, doesn't she? Yeah. Again, something unfinished being opened. Um, but nevertheless, so by the time she's up looking out uh, at uh, Dubai from the tower, this, this tower's purpose has shifted, where it's really at first was about this making this free zone area between Port Rashid and the Trade Center. And by the time before it's even opened, suddenly that, that relationship has been broken open by the, the announcement of Port Jebel Ali. Yeah. So I think that's just architecture just playing this typical role where, I mean, oftentimes the way this building is described is being, it's opening the way to Abu Dhabi and Jebel Ali, which was not the case. It was about anchoring Port Rashid at the mm -hmm. moment, and now it's been redefined that yep. way, yep. which is going into your description of, yes, 1980. And, but yeah, sometimes architecture has to literally pivot to, to be hip or to be, you know, at the moment. It's funny you mention that because there's, there's, there's a diagram. Some of you may have seen it. It's really one of, it's, well, it's, a ti it's, it's, it's actually a timeline, which is about the, the his, uh, sort of timeline of the world's tallest buildings. Yeah. And, and, and it speaks to your point about the, 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 the kind of delay between commissioning and, and realization. Because often the world's tallest building, if you think of the Empire State Building, for example, even the Petronas Tower, well, even the World Trade Center in New York, Petronas Tower, they're commissioned at the height of an economy. They take five, six, seven, however many years, in which time uh, that economy goes from boom to bust. Yeah, yeah. So they often then open uh, in complete kind of ignominy. So uh, the Empire State Building was impossible to fill <laughs> at the beginning, uh, as was the World Trade Center. As was this. As World was Trade this, yeah. and uh, even Canary Wharf. By the time that uh, by the time it was uh, it was opened, and there's something interesting about that uh, in terms of. Uh, that speaks uh, again about the different speeds, as Oscar was talking about, mm. uh, uh, between um, financial economies and then the materialization of that into symbolic form. Which, uh, like it, these buildings, require economies, economic cycles to, to, to go around a number of cycles until they, they find their footing again. Um, we, we've got one more guest now, uh, which brings us right. To the present moment in time, but also in space. But can I have uh, While Awar Al founded IBDA Design uh, Dubai and Tokyo in 2009, he has a multidisciplinary approach to design and is always looking to challenge 
conventional processes uh, pushing the boundaries of architecture. IBDA design is responsible for numerous key projects shaping the design, art, and architecture platforms here in the GCC, one of which happens to be, coincidentally, High D3, where we are right now. Uh, so it's really a perfect alignment, and it, it gives us great pleasure to be able to ask and, and hear uh, well talk about this wonderful venue that we're in and how uh, it does and doesn't play against um, the sort of prevailing language of trade and architecture here in Dubai. So will you please join me in welcoming Wael Al Awa. Thank you. Thank you. So this is, uh, yeah, thank you, Shimon, for the introduction. Um, well, uh, basically, uh, I'll start uh, by uh, introducing uh, or a little bit explaining that my understanding of the title of this talk today, which is Build and Build and its relation to architecture, is simply assembly, the assembling of materials. That's the simple understanding of, of the title. And uh, well, since the, 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 the talk is about trade and its uh, impact on architecture or its relationship with architecture, uh, one of the early forms of trade is the silk route. And uh, that was something I, I was interested in looking into. And, also understanding the, the, the routes, on-land routes. Of, of course, there was also online routes or uh, <laughs> sea routes uh, um, that took place. But trade was on, on camels, was in simple forms at that time. So the material, the movement of material was limited. And uh, I, I think the these uh, forms of moving material on, on, on animals was uh, quite uh, difficult uh, in a way. So they were limited in, in, in numerous ways. Uh, well, a part is missing. But, uh, well, that brings me to, uh, to a little comparison with uh, Bernard Rudowski's book of Architecture Without Architects and Understanding Architecture during that era or in its early forms where uh, architecture really was uh, very much local and it used local materials it, it confined or or uh, it was uh, in relation to the local climate to the local context uh, it trade at that time was very linear so uh, uh, even architecture in that sense was quite limited in in that in that form of understanding. Um, and then you can see here the four different examples of China, Yemen, Italy, and Dubai, how architecture was very, very, very unique to its local environment and was in, in, not, in no way looking similar. Uh, it had its own identity, its own locality, and its own materiality also. Trying to move to next. Okay, whoops. Okay, so how we see it is that uh, architecture without architects, the materials were locals, the skills were locals, speed was slow, and exchange at that time was limited. So architecture at that time was good. I mean, it, it did produce, so, uh, it was in a way good. So then I moved to now, where we are in the 21st century and look comparing that to the silk routes and, and looking at the shipping routes and uh, it's a web I mean it's it's completely different uh, form of trade uh, even the, the you know the 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 movement of uh, materials has moved from the camel to the mega ship and it's just taken on a whole new form and uh, a whole new, it's a, it's a whole new game uh, of trading commodities, goods, and, and even materials in, in, in many ways. And how that also does affect architecture. So then you end up with cities like Dubai, London, Singapore, and Sydney being built by this mega trading environment. But this brings us to a simple question, is that is climate important? Because we, we comparing these four cities, Dubai, London, Singapore, and Sydney, I simply look at the uh, 
local skies of these four cities and if you compare them uh, just by overcast and clear sky you see none of these cities are in any way or form similar they're all completely different from one another and then again looking at uh, culture and looking at the local dance for example and comparing these four cities they have completely different cultures and then uh, we published this in 2014 in Art Dubai's pamphlet where it's just, this is not a poem, I mean, uh, it's uh, trying to move to next, but it's <laughs> stuck, <laughs> okay, so uh, anyway, moving on, I see architecture without architects was good, I think architecture with architects is where we are today and this is what we do. Materials have become unlimited, skills are unlimited, speed has become super fast, and exchange is unlimited. So I think we're in a super age where we have to take advantage of, of what we have uh, in, a, in, a, in a smart way. That's, that's the most important thing, trying to really address and think of the local climate, the local culture, and not uh, it, erasing all of, all, all of that heritage that exists. So slow. Um, Hi D3, okay, so this, uh, we, we designed this project uh, and, and ironically it's also built from containers which is also a, a, a unit of trade which uh, I believe is, is uh, is uh, something that one would not really think of being an architecture element or something that one would inhabit. But uh, it is a module and it has certain proportions and dimensions and can most certainly be used to build something. Um, and the reason uh, we, we use the container is, uh, well, it's not because Dubai is a mega port city and is a, is a mega uh, uh, trading uh, port, but uh, one of the main reasons was the speed in which the whole project had to be designed and built, and the brief required a temporary facility that, sh that only want, uh, had to have a lifespan of five years. So this can be all disassembled, reassembled somewhere else in, in when, when its time is over. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, each of these containers is a, is a recycled container. It's a, it's a container that's actually traveled to so many parts of the world, has, has traded with so many parts of uh, uh, so many other countries. Uh, each container has a small tag on it, just like a license plate number, where you can really track its history and see where it had it has been, it had been, and. And now they finally find home here in, in high D3. Um, well, can you talk, uh, let, just tell us how you source, source these uh, containers? Well, these containers, yes, there is, a, a, we worked with a contractor, obviously, and uh, <coughs> this contractor is a specialist in, in, uh, in containers. So uh, it took them time because we have 80 uh, containers here. So it took them time to source all these uh, containers, but uh, they were, uh, uh, they were at, at their middle of their lifespan because containers are used to a, to, to a point where uh, when they're totally unusable, then they will just what, throw them do, out. Do you know what a life, typical lifespan of a container is? Uh, not, not really. It doesn't uh, adhere to a, a lifespan more. It's about its movement and uh, intensity of use. Yes, I guess. exactly, intensity of use. But it was important for you not to get new containers. But yes, to get yes, old ones yes. Then. Yeah, it was important for us to to uh, to to have a recycled project. Okay, let's say. Yeah. Um, and then the idea also was that uh, uh, to to create a space that's fifty percent architecture and fifty percent landscape. And the reason behind that is, is the idea of the frieze or the neighborhood. Uh, the, the, the planning of the space is very much linked to, uh, let's say, Arabic town planning, mm -hmm. wh what you see also in Bastakia. Uh, 
the, the Frisch kind of uh, uh, planning where the, uh, the architecture and the landscape uh, are, are well balanced between one another, where activity can happen indoors and outdoors, and, uh, and people can move seamlessly between uh, the, the different uh, functions of, of these uh, uh, containers, or uh, modules, let's say. And uh, then you have pockets of different gardens. You have areas for swings there, where you can go and enjoy uh, a swing, while reading a book or having a coffee. There's also a fire pit in the back there. I, I don't think they've ever used it. And, and our Tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. It's freezing cold. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the, the other important element are the terraces uh, that, uh, that continue. I mean, the, we don't see the landscape as something that's only on the ground level, but something that moves up onto the first level also. Um, so, whoops, that was fast. And then, the, uh, of course, the wind towers. The, these are containers. These are 40 foot high cube, uh, also a 40 foot container that's standing up upright that brings in air to, to, to ventilate the uh, courtyard uh, spaces. Um, and the decision to paint them white? white? Well, the decision to paint them white, this is a Thermaguard. It's a special paint, actually, that's highly reflective. Uh, it's because uh, we didn't want them to overheat, because okay. this is a metal. Uh, we had to think of the, you know, the, mo the, the first question anyone asks is that a container, how does this work with, with the heat, with the, with the climate here? Actually, they're all insulated from wall, floor, and ceiling, so they're fully insulated from the inside. And then the paint is a, is a very highly reflective paint. It's a paint that is used on airplanes and, uh, uh, and even uh, uh, space shuttles. So it doesn't absorb heat. It reflects all uh, it reflects So we could put out. this on the moon and it would be fine? Uh, it's the sun is this oh, the problem, sun. not the moon. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, these are a few images. I think you're in this space, so the images won't do a lot of uh, uh, <laughs> We could just Good. look around. Yes, exactly. Um, well, uh, if there's, n I can stop there. If there's, if that's, that's great. Yeah, I have, uh, I have another project to show. If there's no more time, I'll just stop. There. Yeah. Right yeah. Now. Okay. Thank you, Wyatt. Thank you. We have, uh, we've sort of run out of time. Uh, many, many questions. I'm sure you do as well, but. Unfortunately, we've got to keep this sort of moving. But I just have one question that I guess would tie across all of you, which is, I mean, it, it I w has something to do with this, uh, this question of, you know, the, the sort of, uh, what does one aspire to when one is trying to create uh, an image, an architectural image of trade? And whether that... Um, because if we think about um, architecture in the 20th century, one of the uh, one of the categories was that of the international style, right? So, uh, which was the name of a famous exhibition, of course, at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, 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 curated by Philip Johnson and Robin H Hitchcock, uh, and um, there was something uh, something about the promise of the international style was precisely, in a way, to to, to, to transcend uh, like the, in uh, local in vernacular languages, to, to produce something that uh, allegedly could literally begin to fit in uh, anywhere and everywhere. And one of the great things that is, uh, or one, one thing that's sometimes said is, uh, you know, who was the greater architect, uh, Le Corbusier or Mies van der Rohe, and then someone would answer, well, actually, Mies van der Rohe, because he's easier to copy, uh, right? So there are, there are many more, like, bad versions of Mies uh, across the world, arguably, than there are of, 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 of Le Corbusier. And, and I wonder whether each of, either any of you would want to sort of comment on whether, um, whether the international style um, also was a promise or, or sort of uh, uh, was a premonition of uh, a certain kind of international 
style of, of, of trade architecture. Because if we think of the World Trade Center, um, and then Bahrain, when did Bahrain's uh, first World Trade Center open, do you it, know? It wasn't until, it's the one with the wind towers in the middle. I think it was 2001, 2002. And I think Kuwait has just got, uh, just got a new one. And again, I mean, there's something about the, the, uh, the, the, the sort of language of the World Trade Center that seems to pr have produced its own kind of international style. Uh, and I wonder whether you want, any of you would want to say anything about that. Maybe you, Todd, because I, I wonder where that, whether, whether the, 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 the World Trade Center sort of fit in architectural history with the notion of an international style or not. And the, I guess one way to answer that, there are a couple ways I could answer, but just one that quickly comes to mind is, you know, something about um, the, uh, the international style we often don't uh, consider. We look very quickly at the exterior yep. of architecture. Actually, the, there's so much about international style that was the interior. And um, while, uh, you know, the, the World Trade Center is often seen as, as an icon, it was never called an icon, it was called a landmark, but really the focus was on the interior and this kind of development of what it meant to be a global businessman. You know, what did the global businessman expect mm. when he opened the glass doors? Because his doors were glass, he expected to come into mar marble. Right, uh, and these kinds of these the surfaces of the interior and, and the surfaces of, of furniture, the surface of service, uh, which is all part of I think the international style, uh, but was really what people were purchasing um, more so than I think actually the maybe what architects focus on uh, when they quickly think of of international style. Yeah, keep it there. Nora, maybe you could describe the World Trade Center in Bahrain. <laughs> You've all seen it. No, it's there are twin towers uh, with three wind turbines in the middle, and I think probably, you know, it brings the problematic of architecture and image, you know, which is a lot more so, you know, than you know whether we're trying to represent trade or. It's, you know, the interlinking of architecture and the image it produces and how, you know, so often we have such a superficial reading of architecture and it, what it's supposed to represent. And I think, you know, these World Trade Centers uh, are just, you know, that's often why they produce this kind of architecture. It's because they're image makers. And at the time in 2001, when, you know, the World Trade Center in Bahrain was built, the idea was of sustainability, um, you know, of a more uh, probably inclusive economic growth, a more sustainable future. And then you have, you know, three stupid wind turbines in the middle of two twin towers that are actually, I think, probably, you know, not generated by the wind, but by electricity. <laughs> but, you know, it's a whole rhetoric that produces this kind of architecture. Uh, and if you dig a lot deeper, you know, and you look into building regulations and they often move in a completely opposite direction than the architecture they're pro you know that's produced through them you know, and I think the World Trade Center as a program is represents that the best no and, and maybe the last thing then uh, maybe while well, you would want to say something about this is I mean one reason they have to be so tall is that they can uh, become uh, part of a skyline and it seems to me the way, in, one way in which cities trade on a global stage is through through mm. skylines, and uh, and there's something about uh, uh, you know uh, a World Trade Center uh, being a major part of that skyline that seems to be part of the language in which cities feel that they, they that they have they they have to sort of possess in order to be able to trade. At a, at a certain, and, a, and of course, Dubai, in that sense, Dubai has been, uh, I mean, for all its criticism, the, the production of a, of, a, of a recognizable skyline is something that it's mm -hmm. done remarkably well in that, in that sense. Um, well, there's, I mean, it, there's a lot to think about there, but I, uh, the, the interesting thing that I find about Dubai's trade center, uh, World Trade Center, is that 
it really does have a very local identity from the exterior, the architecture. It's, uh, it's, um, it's got its architecture and its design works very well in its context, I believe. And, uh, and that's very different from other trade centers around the world where uh, I believe trade centers are built uh, to be neutral in image and more uh, international where uh, you know they want to show an image of uh, uh, glass I, I think or, or I, w I wouldn't want to say glass but uh, I mean that a copy or a replica of, of somewhere else, but, but here it has a more unique identity and, and that is something that is very different from the rest of the Dubai skyline because if you look at the rest of the Dubai skyline, it really is a skyline that can exist anywhere else in the world. And that's where I was showing the four cities and that they, you cannot tell which is which uh, at, at some point, where, where trade uh, really um, or, or the glo globalization and that this form of trade takes over and everything just becomes a, a, a singular image, the dollar or the yen or the euro or, or that, that's the image that yeah. takes over. Fantastic. We have run out of time. Will you please join me in thanking Noura, Todd and Wael. Thank you. Thank you.